All right, excellent. Hello, everybody. I am so excited to be here at our first Blender convention in North America. Woo, that's right, let's hear it. All right, there we go, there I am. So uh, my name is Mike Festa. Um, I'm not a 3D artist, but I would say I'm a 3D enthusiast and I'm more of a engineer and software developer. But I've had this passion for 3D, um, really going back to when I was in high school, had an AutoCAD class and we were using uh, 3D Studio Max 1.0 uh, back in the day. This is around the time Toy Story came out, so I was really inspired by the um, you know, visual effects. And to be able to create content like that on my own was pretty amazing. Um, I got into Blender probably about 17 years ago, I think around 2.4. And uh, the thing I love about Blender, being an engineer, is that I can actually code it, I can you know, extend it. There's a whole bunch of exciting tools. Um, but today, I'm here to talk about photogrammetry. Um, in a lot of conversations I've had with folks at the conference today, uh, it's great to see that photogrammetry is alive and well. And so perhaps for this audience, you may already know what photogrammetry is, but for those of you watching on YouTube or at home, um, I'm gonna talk about, you know, one of my favorite things, and that's photogrammetry. So when I first discovered it, to me it just felt like magic, right? You can take pictures, essentially, of an object, especially a complex object, and kind of put it into a machine and spit out something that, you know, would take hours, days, weeks to model by hand. Um, and so, you know, this is a personal project that I had uh, Thanksgiving a couple years ago. My wife made a nice pie and I thought I'm going to just put together a little lifestyle scene and, you know, see what I can do as far as, uh, you know, modeling this. And so this was kind of, you know, my photo and then what did it look like once I modeled it? Well, actually just kidding, that was the, that was the model, right? So. For the folks in the audience that do uh, high-end VFX, yeah, you can probably tell, but for the average person, you know, looking at a render like this, it looks pretty photorealistic. Um, and, you know, I'm able to do this by individually digitizing each of these uh, objects with a process called photogrammetry, right? So basically just a quick overview, you take a lot of photos of an object from all angles, uh, software can kind of magically calculate the distance based on the de depth perception from two different images, and it calculates that out to a three-dimensional point cloud. From that point cloud, it can turn it into a mesh. And my favorite part about it is the textures that come back onto it capture a lot of that authentic detail that can be really hard to kind of fake and grime and get all these little uh, nuances that really bring it to life and make it look believable. But it is a fairly you know, large file, right? This giraffe here was um, 3.4 million triangles or so. And so you'll get into these fairly complex photogrammetry scenes that um, they're just not performant real time. If you're using it for CGI or putting it in the background, you can probably use it just as is. Um, but for a lot of the work that I've done, um, in fact, I had a team at Wayfair. So if you know Wayfair, we sell a lot of furniture. And Wayfair was looking into using CGI to help customers better visualize their products in their home. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to start a team that was focused on AR, VR, 3D within the company. And we're using photogrammetry as one of our teams to essentially do products that would be too complex or too expensive to pay an artist to model. Um, you know, furniture that's kind of boxy, tables and chairs and couches, that was actually more cost effective for us to just do by hand. Uh, but things, you know, like some of the sculptures that we have up here, uh, those were fairly complex and they just weren't really worth the time or the effort to do by hand, but yet they were still required to complete the scene. So a lot of decor and other items. Um, so we had scanned maybe a thousand or so products. I got a chance to kind of really understand and know the technique. And, you know, again, this is kind of something that I've always kind of personally been passionate about, but there are still some challenges to photogrammetry. Uh, it's not a magic bullet. You know, there's complexity that you get out of this, you know, you need to physically have the product. Uh, I need to take hundreds of pictures, a lot of data, and you get a lot of, uh, you know, triangles in your mesh. It's also kind of static and fixed. If you get stuff that would move or flop, you have to kind of lock that in. Um, so, you know, again, it's not perfect. It's like a lot of tools in our toolkit. You know, one of these things that if it makes sense for the right product or the right object or the right thing in your background, then use it. But, you know, if not, that's fine too. But I think it's a pretty cool uh, technique. So anyway, this is kind of my background. Um, back in the fall, I had a friend reach out to me who works at a big tech company and was just looking for some advice. He said, hey, you know what? I get 300 shoes 
And I'll just point out that this uh, image here is the only AI generated image in the presentation. Um, I just asked for you know a movie poster from 300 with some shoes in it. Um, because these guys had 300 shoes that they wanted to digitize at the highest quality possible. And they were looking for you know photogrammetry solution. Knowing that I knew this space pretty well, they were hoping I could recommend another company to do it. Um, but the more I get to understand the requirements and the time frame, I thought, you know what? This is something that I might be able to work with. Um, you know, I work with another studio of talented 3D artists. They could handle kind of the cleanup work. I could handle the capture work. Um, but you know, these products weren't just any shoes. They weren't just you know the sneakers that you see on a lot of uh, 3D websites for scanning or turntables, etc. These were things that had straps, or they had glitter, or they had you know rhinestones and diamonds. Um, so not your standard, you know, photogrammetry, and it was a challenge, but, you know, when I, I was up for that challenge, and uh, they physically mailed me some sample shoes, so these are the models, they're both models, but you can see, uh, you know, on the right-hand side, essentially what the geometry looks like. Um, these ones I photo scanned by hand. I originally tried using a turntable setup that I had from my previous startup, but it was, you know, kind of low-quality DSLRs. We had a few of them, so it was fast, um, but I found that by hand shooting, with a nice lens that I rented from the photo store, I was able to get results that were, you know, pretty good. Um, so the result there was that we won the contract. So, yay, that's exciting, but you know, now what? I've got 300 shoes and a month to do it. Uh, just dividing that out, it's like, I gotta be doing at least 10 of these a day, and you know, how are we gonna do that? So I'm an engineer, and of course, automation was the first thing that I think about. And now, to be clear, this is an AI. Again, we only had that one AI image today. Um, AI for 3D reconstruction, you know, I've seen a lot of pitches, a lot of um, interesting papers. It's just not quite there yet, right? It's hard to hallucinate parts of a product that a customer is expecting to be realistic when you're just filling in details. Um, so, you know, my solution here is on automation, and this is kind of the rough idea of the pipeline. Um, again, I mentioned one of the challenges of photogrammetry is you need the physical sample. Um, so this was kind of interesting. They uh, basically shipped Amazon product to my house, and um, Amazon wasn't the company, by the way, but they still used Amazon to just deliver 300 shoes to my house over about a week. And so I think my neighbors and the delivery guys were probably wondering, oh, what's going on? What's with like dozens of packages showing up multiple times a day? Um, but you know, we stored all the products. Um, I prepped the products, so a lot of these were kind of non-traditional photogrammetry products that you just throw on a turntable and you're ready to go. There was some surface prep required, so high gloss. Um, a cool trick that I learned uh, online from, I forget who, but thank you for whoever uh, shared this technique, is you get this uh, mushroom growing box and you put some foot powder in there and then you stick a shop vac in there and it creates a big cloud and the dust just kind of settles right over on the product and it's a great way to take out some of the glare. That combined with things like cross polarization, and you can manage to capture details that normally would be pretty hard with photogrammetry. Um, but I set up a you know automated rig, capture the uh, the thing, process it, and then we have some human artists involved to do the final cleanup and touch up, and then finally some more code and scripting to deliver the uh, product to the end user. Here's kind of a quick snapshot of the hardware, and unfortunately I don't have enough time to really go into the details of the hardware, but um, I'll provide some content on that as a follow-up. Uh, but you know, here's a kind of basic setup. So, you know, I had a pretty nice camera, got a good lens, a ring flash made a big difference. So being able to kind of shoot that product as it was moving meant that I didn't have to stop the turntable. And uh, I got a pretty cool, um, it was a Canadian startup called Exebo that they've got a slider rail for you know, pretty low money, I think it was about $3,000, compared to robotic arms that I was looking into that were much more expensive, this was a pretty good solution. So I was able to have like one high-end camera and I could move it to different positions and then spin the turntable around um, to capture the product. And the end result was it was about 15 minutes to do three different orientations per product. Um, but of course, I don't necessarily have time to go into that today. I did just start a YouTube channel, so I gotta do my shameless plug to like and subscribe. Uh, my channel's so new that you can probably still be one of my first hundred uh, subscribers, so go ahead and do that. And hopefully by the time this uh, gets live, I'll have that uh, hardware video where I show how I built this rig. Uh, some of the software that I used, uh, Agisoft Metashape was kind of the standard workhorse for the photogrammetry piece of it. Uh, of course, Blender, I'm here at the Blender convention talking about how great Blender is because that was a key piece of both 
ingesting and automating and then the actual manual work from the artists. Um, and then Python, which you know is a nice integration with Blender. Uh, we use Python to kind of string everything together. Um, and then 3dmf.com is just my personal website. I had a startup a few years back and this was kind of my spiritual successor to that effort. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the retopology workflow. So once I capture the content, um, actually wait, one more slide, sorry. Yeah, before the retopology workflow, I actually wanna talk about the um, time it took to process, right? So the capture time was 15 minutes. I wanted to see if I could get this whole assembly line to be 15 minutes throughout per product. Um, it ended up taking about an hour per product to go through each of the steps, but I was able to run four at once and you know, put the specs on there. So feel free to you know, follow along, build something somewhere at home, and again, more content kind of in the YouTube channel to describe you know, that exact process. Um, but yeah, the re topology workflow is important because these products look good when they come out of the scanner, but they don't look perfect, right? There's still, you know, a few issues that you'll see, um, you know, even from those initial kind of white bottles that I had with the rhinestones, like to get those stones to actually look good, an artist actually comes in and draws each of the gems and aligns it and cleans it up. So for this particular project, since we were making these basically hero models, um, there was an additional amount of time that needed to be put in, uh, in a tool like Blender to basically be able to draw all the details and fix all the textures and add all the additional maps beyond the diffuse map that you just get from photogrammetry. Um, so that kind of comes in, you know, my hero team called SuperDNA. Um, I'm the CTO within this group and we do a lot of model production for big brands and big companies. Um, they're the largest producer of Amazon content right now. So if you tried virtual try on for glasses or shoes um, on the Amazon app, we basically produce thousands of those per month. Um, so I knew the team was up to the, the work to be able to get this many products done for us. Um, but it does take, you know, 12 to 24 hours per product on top of the scanning time. So it's not a you know, simple endeavor, but the end results with the photogrammetry input, I'll show at the end, they ended up, uh, we're pretty pleased with it. Um, all right, so breaking it down, we typically have our teams work on geometry and then texture separately. The geometry on these for the most part came out pretty good. Uh, occasionally you get different you know, tricky materials or different you know, jewels that get a little squishy and have to kind of get you know, shaped and cleaned up, but the team would basically go and retopologize re everything, um, sometimes break out different components, create different seams, re, you know, draw all the little um, zippers and, and everything else. Um, then after that, we'd go on to the material side. So the team was able to leverage the diffuse texture that came out of the photogram tree. But then on top of that, you know, you still need to generate other maps we're building these for GLTF, um, which is basically a real-time web viewer. And so you have multiple textures in that. We typically bake them down into like a single texture sheet. So this is uh, kind of hard to see on the screen, but that's like the normal map. And we're able to ba bake the normal map down from the high-res geometry. But there's sometimes some artifacts you got to kind of come in and fix those up. But a few of the great Blender features that I want to call out or things like being able to texture paint from your camera. So if you've got a scene exported out of something like Metashape, you can have all your different camera positions um, aligned with your photos, and then you can go into the texture painting tool within Blender, and you can just actually paint anything that didn't blend in nicely. Um, or if you have another reference photo, maybe with a higher quality logo or different logo, because the one you scanned is like different than the one that's like updated, you can go back and you kind of texture paint those. Um, and then Material Nodes is another great tool. Um, coming off the diffuse texture, you might be able to kind of fake a roughness map by just kind of tweaking things and being able to just do that in real time is a huge benefit. But you can also bake your textures out. So these texture sheets end up being, you know, just kind of a single texture for your whole model. Um, and you can do that in Blender. And the ambient inclusion can also be baked for real time. Um, one of the cool things that actually ended up surprising our clients that they didn't think we were able to do was hair and fur. So we had shoes like this that, you know, looking at it, you're like, you know, I'm going to scan this thing. This looks like it has a toupee, you know, sitting on it. Um, but it turns out like we were actually able to scan pretty good base models. And then those kind of broken pieces of geometry, just delete those out and use the hair tool to kind of come in, comb it in and get it looking really good. 
And these actually do export out to like a web-ready GLTF file. Now, of course, it's a gigabyte for some of them, so you're not really going to be deploying that over the web, but it does play in real time, uh, which I think is you know, pretty impressive. All right, so we're almost at the end. Here's the result. Mission accomplished. We're able to get to a point where it's capturing three, uh, 30 scans a day, like my busiest day. And we did 100% completion, which was another exciting thing because within the contract, there was kind of a 5% tolerance with the expectation that some of these fuzzy things or some of the glittery things or you know, whatever, like we're not gonna be able to do, but we were able to do it. Um, so that was pretty exciting. And uh, you know, there's a few photos up here, but then I'm gonna just play a short video that shows uh, some of the final renders. And uh, yeah, so I'll play a little video here. And these are all rendered out in cycles. Um, I just kind of scripted this as a quick way to pull in and visualize these products. But they also look uh, just about as good, I would say, in the web viewer. But yeah, so anyone who's interested in photogrammetry, please find me today. I love talking about this topic. Uh, again, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm going to be trying to put out more content around this, around things like AR and VR, and just content creation in general. And, uh, you know, that's it for me. So thank you all very much and have a great rest of the conference.